You're clean, aren't you? Except for your tower. You're a tower junkie, Roland. Hello and welcome to Tower Junkies, presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. Tower Junkies is a podcast devoted to Stephen King and his magnum opus, The Dark Tower Series. We discuss the themes, characters, and mythology of the series in Palaver episodes and review the books and comic series in Kef episodes. We also discuss King novels related to The Dark Tower, non-Tower King novels, TV and film adaptations of King's work, and the latest news about potential Dark Tower-related adaptations. You can find more of our work at TowerJunkiesPod.com and follow us on every level of social media at Tower Junkies. Pod. I'm your host, Matt Hurt, and with me today is, as always, my car mate, Tiny. Hello, friends. Hi, Tiny. That was an interesting voice. Yeah. Cool. I don't know why. Yeah. That's fine. We're getting back into the swing of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, as you hopefully know, last time on the podcast, we reviewed Castle Rock episodes one and two after a lengthy six or seven month hiatus. Oh, yep. Yep. Um, <laughs> and, uh,. Uh, so now that we're back we're, and we're several episodes behind on Castle Rock, we're going to do a, <laughs> uh, a different episode that's yeah. not Castle Rock related. But it's forgivable because all things 19. Exactly. Yes. yes. So this was um, an idea, well, sort of, an, like, I knew that the 19th episode would have to be a significant episode for us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, originally I wanted it to just be a palaver about the way 19 appears throughout the series and in right, right. the dark tower. But I, we, we came up with this idea, this alternate idea where today on the podcast, we're going to be disclosing to you, um, our top 19 Stephen King novels. Mm -hmm. And so the way that this is going to work is that the idea is that we will have a top 19 for each of us. And then anytime we review a novel by Stephen King, we will set some time aside to discuss whether or not it will make either one of our top 19s, what, what book it will knock out if it does, um, and where it would rank among his other work that we've read. So, it's a pretty big episode for us because it's going to have some um, long-standing ramifications for the podcast going yeah. forward. Yeah. Um, so it's exciting. Um, but before we actually get into all that, uh, we have a few things we got to go over. One is, of course, if you are in Indianapolis, uh, please, please come to Shocktober in Irvington. <laughs> um, it's our fifth year doing it. It's a one-night event screening of short horror films from local filmmakers here local to Indianapolis. Um, it is in Irvington, which is just on the east side of downtown Indianapolis. We basically rent out a venue and screen short horror films. We will hopefully be having uh, a Stephen King adaptation um from five after five productions their adaptation of the man who loved flowers um so there will be that stephen king connection and um like last year we are going to be raffling off prizes and i already have my eyes set on some uh stephen king related prizes that we're going to be raffling off so Mm -hmm. so yeah go to shocktoberandirvington.com buy your tickets it's october 12th 2018 at playground production studios and for more information once again go to shocktoberandirvington.com and yeah, so, uh, Tiny, before we get into our lists, we have, of course, Stephen King news mm-hmm. and, uh, some check ins. So, first of all, news broke that, um, the adaptation, the new adaptation for Tommy Knockers is going to be written by Jeremy Slater, hmm. who was the creator of the Exorcist TV show. Oh, um, interesting. Okay. Yeah, and I believe he was also. Um, let me double check this to confirm because I'm pretty sure that it, well, actually I don't, oh yeah, he, uh, uh, his credits include, hmm. Uh, okay. So, uh, Slater's recent credits, this is from the rap.com Slater's recent credits, credits include show running two seasons of Fox's the exorcist, which I have heard good things about Okay. on the feature side. Slater's credits include death note, uh, which was Netflix's, um, adaptation of the famous manga that whitewashed everything and apparently okay. had nothing to do with the manga. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Yep. Um, also, The Lazarus Effect, which on Obsessive Viewer, Mike uh, 
Mike, our co-host who's on sabbatical from the podcast, he uh, is a huge horror movie fan, mm-hmm. and he is he's the most forgiving horror movie fan I've ever met. Right. So he's very forgiving for st- for things, and I remember specifically him talking about the Lazarus effect and saying that it is complete garbage. Okay. And then probably the crown jewel of this guy's writing credits, not to badmouth him or anything, is um, the Fantastic Four. <laughs> Oh boy! Yeah, man, that's so, that's a, like that's like a rap sheet. It it is instead of a credit. Sheet. Yep. Boy. And, uh, yeah, and I haven't read Tommy Knockers. I did just recently spend an audible credit on it, so I'm going to read that at some point. Okay. Um, it's a blind spot for me too. Is it okay? Yeah. Nice. Um, well, I will have to assign it to you. I know the basic premise. Yeah, me too. That's about it. There was a. A TV series back in like the nineties, I yeah. think, with like Jimmy Smiths and mm. I don't I don't know. I think I watched some of it, but right. I, I remember like nothing. So, okay. So I should be pretty pretty fresh fresh for that one. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Um that's all the really all the news that I have. Um one thing that I did forget to mention last time we, we were we were doing the podcast was that um his Stephen King's new book, Ev- uh, Elevation, is gonna come out. I think it's going to come out on Halloween. Um, oh. I believe it's going to be a novella, so it's going to be short. Okay. Um, it's available to pre- to pre-order on on Audible for ten bucks, but um, he is doing the narration for it. Oh, so, interesting. Yeah, so that should be fun. Cool. You haven't you haven't you haven't listened to the Wind Through the Keyhole? Have not. Okay, he does the narration for that. And okay, yeah, friend of the show, Matt and Draco. Um, he. Uh, he isn't a fan of his narration. Okay. <laughs> so I didn't have a, much of a problem with it. So it's it's interesting. Can't be great at everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so check-ins. Do you have any Stephen King check-ins? Yes. Nice. Today, literally a matter of hours ago, I finished listening to Pet Cemetery. Nice. Uh, as narrated by Michael C. Hall mm-hmm. of Dexter fame. Uh, yep. Uh, yep. <laughs> um, he, so yeah, I finished that. Um, it's... I'll be talking a little bit more about it later, but Mm -hmm. really, really enjoyed it. And specifically Michael Hall's performance. Mm -hmm. Uh, He did, he did a great job. Yeah. Like we were talking before we recorded. So when I said, Oh, nice. That was completely fake. (laughs) (laughs) Cause I already knew. Yeah. But, um, yeah, just like I, I've been listening to, to get back into the groove of doing tower junkies. I've been re listening to our old episodes and like, it's funny cause I'm, if you go back and I'm, I'm insufferable really because <laughs> in the early episodes, I keep saying, Oh, Steven Weber's performance in, in the it audiobook is incredible. And yeah. I still stand by that. But Michael C. Hall is really incredible in, nice. uh, in doing Pet Cemetery. Uh, like I, when he switches to like Judd or Ellie or any of the other characters, I forget, like, I forget that it's him. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just, it's, it's so good. Absolutely. Yep. Um, yeah, they get some good actors to do Stephen mm-hmm. King books. Um, oh, yeah. I'm particularly fond of, uh, bleh, that's pretty bad. Mm-hmm. I can't remember his name. Will Patton? Will Patton, thank nice. you. Um, yeah. doing the, uh, Hodges trilogy. Hodges trilogy. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I knew it was a trilogy. Right. That's about it. But uh, but no, like I I was a bit like I was such a big fan of him narrating it that I couldn't picture anyone else. Oh yeah. Playing Bill Hodges, mm-hmm. but him. Um, I know nice. he doesn't in the series that's out, but uh, right. Uh, but anyways, yeah, like I I just loved his voice work. Me too. Uh, in in those books, so yeah, I hope they continue that trend. Yeah. Oh, me too. With his books. Yeah. Absolutely. I haven't looked around at his other. The other King audiobooks that are already out right now mm. to see if there's any noteworthy names. Oh, I I'm sure there you, are some. Yeah, other well, than Stephen Weber and it. I know you talked about yeah. that a lot. Have you, when reading the Dark Tower, have you, you've never have you never done audiobooks? I've never done an audiobook. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, two words I'm gonna or two names I'm gonna throw out at you. Uh, Frank Muller. Okay. Incredible. Like we we talk a lot about how Aaron Paul is Eddie Dean in our mind. Mm-hmm. Um, listening to Frank Muller do Eddie Dean is like, it's like, it's a thick New York accent and it's Mm -hmm. like, that's the voice of Eddie Dean. Nice. And, uh, it's, it's really, and we'll get to this at some point (laughs) in the future, but, um, it's really tragic because he actually had a motorcycle accident, um, that left him in a vegetative state Right after... The f- in between books four and five. Mm-hmm. So uh, George Waddell 
did five, six, and seven. Mm-hmm. Um, and he he does a great job as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Good. Good shit. Yep. Yeah. Kind of kind of a downer. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, do you good. have a check in, Maddie? I or? do. Okay. So I forgot to mention this last time, but I uh, had a little bit of pocket change. And so, Tiny, let me ask you this. Do you use Voodoo at all for digital? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Mm-hmm. So I, um, uh, for like digital video purchases and stuff, mm-hmm. um, if you go to letterbox.com and go to my letterbox at Obsessive Viewer, you'll see a list of, I have a list dedicated to all the movies I own digitally. But I purchased a Stephen King bundle um, in HD. Uh, for twenty one ninety nine. Nice. That bundle includes Cujo, okay, The Dead Zone, Silver Bullet, which I've never seen, mm-hmm. uh, Pet Cemetery, uh, Graveyard Shift, which I've never seen nor read, mm-hmm. and Thinner. That's a nice deal. Yeah, it's not bad yeah. for for twenty two bucks. Um, and like I love Cujo. Mm-hmm. Uh, we talked about the Dead Zone before, and I liked it a lot. I'm excited to revisit it at Pet Cemetery as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, the reason that I was excited to bring that up is that when, because <laughs> you mentioned that you finished Pet Cemetery, I finished it yesterday. So um, sometime between you know our Castle Rock episodes, and uh, we're gonna have Fekas on to talk about the Gunslinger. Um, w- one of the balls that we have in the air. For <laughs> Tower Junkies is going to be Pet Cemetery reviews, and so uh, Tiny, if you want, I can give you my Voodoo password so you can watch it on Voodoo. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah. So that's my check in. I'm excited. I did. I did watch Cujo just kind of in the background while editing Obsessive Viewer. So mm. it's good. I haven't seen the movie. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. I've, I've You've read, read the book though, right? I've read the book. Yeah. yeah. Um. Spoiler alert, are we, are we going to be talking about Kudrow? We are. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, okay, so there is a book that isn't on my list that's on yours. Woof, woof. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, uh, I don't know. Watching Kujo, I and I, I tweeted this on my Obsessive Viewer account, but um, uh, <laughs> uh, I had the... Because when, when I edit podcasts and I watch stuff in the background, I put the closed captions on and I kind of turn the volume down. Mm-hmm. So that way I'm not, you know, obviously I can't listen to something while I'm listening to a podcast. But um, <laughs> whoever did the closed captioning for Cujo is just so uh, uh, above and beyond, went above and beyond, because he or she... Um, <laughs> There's a scene at the beginning of Kujo when he's going into the little like uh, hole where the where I think in the movie it's a bat that gets him, or maybe a rat. I'm not sure, but um, he he barks and so the closed caption says "woof." <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So anyway, so without further ado, let's go into our top 19. Let's do it. Yes. So the way that we're going to do this is I have my top 19 in order because I'm anal. Mm-hmm. And Tiny, your top five is in a very particular order, but six through 19 is... Uh, no particular order. No particular order. Yeah. Okay. So the way I'm going to do this, or the way we're going to do this, is I'm going to get us kicked off and talk about my number 19, and then if it's on your list, uh, you know, go ahead and sure. have a discussion. Okay. So, yeah, let's get us kicked off. So number 19 for me uh, is a book that we talked about in episode six of the podcast, Gerald's Game. Okay. Yes. And uh, I picked... Uh, it's on my list for a few reasons. Um, oh, first of all, we should probably mention, I've I've read 30 novels from King and you've read 29? Correct. Okay. So, yeah. So, that's the that's the numbers of the books that we're pulling our, uh, our stuff from. Yes. Um, so, uh, just I really love... Or I really enjoyed uh, Gerald's Game because it seemed like kind of a writing challenge for King. Um, just the way that uh, uh, Jesse Burlingame, how she is uses her inner voice to kind of come to terms with this trauma that's in her past, just was really strong character work. And as we always say, character work is above and beyond like the best part of Stephen King and being Stephen King fans. Mm-hmm. Um, and even though the story is kind of lacking in the outward antagonist department a little bit, the way it handles the evil. Um, both external and internal um, of her imprisonment uh, imprisonment is very memorable. 
So again, yeah. we reviewed that on episode six. Is that on your list, Tiny? It is. Um, yeah, I have it. I have it set at number thirteen, but that's okay. That's uh, kind of a relevant number mm-hmm. or arbitrary number. So yeah, I, I agree. It's uh, top nineteen for me. It has. Um, I I love the almost like ambiguity of whether or not there's some supernatural forces at play. Yeah. Um, not to spoil it. I hope I hope that's not a spoiler, but no. um, th- just there's some ambiguity about that in mm-hmm. there, and like I think you can kind of interpret it how you want. And I really love it when Stephen King does that. Yeah, um, he he plays that fiddle very well, if you will. Um, he does oh, a good yeah. job with that. So yeah, and you know I was, it's you're right. It's it's a fun. I don't know about a fun challenge. It's a fun challenge as a reader, mm-hmm. or it's. Uh, the challenge of writing a story that's so compartmentalized mm-hmm. into one location and a lot of it, you know, like takes place inside the mind of the main character as opposed to being, you know, like a, a dialogue. Right. Um, that's, that's a challenge as a writer. Not that, mm-hmm. not that I've ever written a story, right. but uh, I can imagine that'd be really hard. You're just really putting yourself in a box and mm-hmm. to overcome, not only overcome that, but uh, excel in that mm-hmm. it, with those limitations is really impressive. Um, and so for, just, just for those reasons, it makes it a really unique story. And, mm-hmm. um, I, I'd say maybe not outside of his wheelhouse, but just, just different and just, mm-hmm. just challenging. And, and he just, he, he hit it out of the park. Nice. Yeah. So, um, I think there were, I don't know if I'd say there were rumors of it, but like, uh, it's funny cause, uh, Gerald's game, if I'm not mistaken, came in a time where like he wrote, and and you can you guys can fact check me on this all you want. I'm I'm not sure if this is, I'm not 100 percent concrete on this, but I think he wrote in somewhat quick succession, uh, Gerald's Game, Rose Matter, and Del- Dolores Claiborne. Okay. So he had this string of novels that were there was a female protagonist, which mm. is you know not unheard of in King's work, but um, it's um, I wouldn't say an anomaly, but it's it's a uh, Something that's infrequent, right? Uh, to have central figures, and I think I read somewhere that there were theories that Tabitha King actually wrote Gerald's game. Oh, really? <laughs> or like Ghost wrote it for him, or something? Oh, uh, okay. I, I don't. I, huh. I don't know about all that, but, um, but yeah. So so yeah, I I really enjoyed Gerald's game, and uh, yeah, that's my number nineteen, and Tiny's number six through nineteen. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, shall I go on to number 18? Please do. Okay. And also, a uh, quick addendum to Gerald's game. While I was making my list and, and checking it twice, um, I <laughs> – sorry. <laughs> I um, I had the thought, like, we're, we're going to have to do, like, episode 119 or something, or maybe episode 99 uh-huh. uh, can be uh, our top 99 um, <laughs> or 19 uh, Stephen King adaptations. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, so well, we might actually have to do that, you know, in the near future. Right. After Castle Rock, you know. Right, right. But anyway, uh, my number 18 is um, the first in a series of entries in this, um, The Dark Tower 6, Song of Susanna. Okay. And, uh, yeah, so obviously, obviously, you know, we've said we're, you know, tower junkies Mm -hmm. if you if you know what podcast you're listening to (laughs) so obviously this is the first of spoiler alert seven books that are going to be on my list okay and so while it is not not including win through the keyhole because that's not on the list but of the main dark tower books this is obviously the lowest rated one or lowest ranked one and even despite that i still i still like it i feel like it's a bit underrated um I feel like it's kind of regarded as the worst Dark Tower book. Mm-hmm. Would you say that? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And I just I just I I kind of have this weird affinity for it. Like it does bridge books books 5 and 7. And so at times it feels sort of incomplete in that regard, but I really think that it makes up for it with some very cool batshit crazy world building. <laughs> um and probably the biggest point that I'll make, because I, I have some other notes, but um, I just think it's really impressive how King took Song of Susanna and used that to bring us into the end game of the series. And I won't go into specifics, obviously, but King doesn't like to outline when he writes. And 
I just love seeing how he takes certain plot threads throughout the series that stretch all the way back in some cases to the first book of the series and ties them together into these latter pages of the series. I just think the way that he does that is it's a good indication of why he's such a great storyteller. Mm -hmm. Um, And just, I think it's really admirable and the way that the way that certain events kind of come together in song of Susanna is actually one of the most compelling elements of the entire series for me. Wow. Um, yeah. And also, uh, there's some good character stuff and also the Ted corporation. I love that. I love that bit. Okay. So yeah. Is that on your list? It's not on my list. Oh, interesting. I, okay. I, I think it is the worst Star Tower book, mm-hmm. and I don't like it. <laughs> interesting. Not, okay. not a fan That's of it. Fair. I feel like it's, um, I feel like it was like a little bus stop in the story, mm-hmm. and it drove me nuts. I felt like it was, um, it was all set up for book seven, and mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't even like the ending of book five, Wolves of the Kala, right? Where it, the, the direction that took, mm-hmm. um, I, so in, that leading into six just made it even worse for me. Uh, Song of Susanna, but yeah, I just, I think it's um, it's it's a lot of toil to me. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of toil going on, which is a a word I use a lot to describe when characters are just chilling, mm-hmm. like going through some shit and not not like they're already really well developed characters, and you have them going through more development. And I just think it's like it's it's superfluous or unnecessary mm-hmm. or just annoying frankly it's like let's move the story along now like that's kind of how i felt throughout song of Susanna. um okay i just yeah i just wasn't uh just not a fan of it really interesting that's that's cool um i'm curious how how or if your opinion will change when we get to that in the podcast Mm -hmm. um but as far as like toiling characters and stuff obviously that's something that is is something that Stephen King never does. No, never. <laughs> he never but, does it for a full for all, an entire book in the middle of a series. No, right. he never does that. Um, but I do remember the like the last time I read uh, Song of Susanna, um, I actually listened to the audiobook, and it was on my way down to Evansville to visit Mike, the aforementioned Mike, because mm-hmm. um, it was for his baby shower for his him and Amanda's baby shower for their first for their firstborn kid, Oscar. Okay, and it's just it's. That's a very interesting book to to listen to. Yeah, on a three hour commute to go to your friend's baby shower. It is. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah. So so it's not on your list, which is cool. So, mm-hmm. um, my number seventeen is Salem's Lot. Okay. Which I will say this with a caveat: I have not read Salem's Lot in a while. Mm-hmm. And my memory of it is a little fuzzy, but it's I like my memory of it is that it's frightening and it's more of a the its placement on the list is more for nostalgia, I guess, because um it was one of my first introductions to King, and more specifically, it was one of my first introductions to the way that he can build a town in tandem with building a story around it, yeah, um. And also it made vampires interesting and cool for me. Um, <laughs> is, is Salem's Lot on your list? It is on mine, yeah. Nice. Um, I have it set at number 16 for no particular reason. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I, I agree with, with what you said. I, I think uh, the town of Jerusalem's Lot, he does a really good job of of rounding out what that is as a town, like the local culture of Jerusalem's Lot, mm-hmm. um, which he he's done in plenty of other books. Um, but like, like for example, I just finished listening to Pet Cemetery and like mm-hmm. the town of Ludlow where that takes place doesn't necessarily have that. He doesn't necessarily round out the town of Ludlow, which he didn't need to for that right. book, but it's just, it's fun because he's a character developer and mm-hmm. he can make his settings into really interesting characters. Mm-hmm. Um, and he does, he did that with, uh, with Jerusalem's lot and, uh, and there's the, there's a particular part in the book where he goes through like a certain timeline Mm-hmm. Um, of like we this person, yeah, yeah. I know we talked about it before, and I, I won't go into it, but that's like one of my, 
one of like probably my favorite like segments of Stephen King's like whole career. Mm-hmm. Like that's just I, I just thought that was really clever and like it's because it's an example of him. He basically tells a mini story. Mm-hmm. He tells like twenty mini stories within a certain day or time period. And I was like, that's just like I think that'd be kind of fun as a writing exercise almost. Oh, it's yeah. almost like he was doing a writing exercise. Um and he just had fun with it and it turned into a really compelling part of the book. Mm-hmm. Um and there's so many other things to like about uh Salem's Lot, especially I think uh the fact that it's kind of like a traditional horror um genre, like the the vampire genre. And he yeah. just kind of does does his own thing with it, and yeah. just he's Nods like to Nosferatu and stuff. right, right. And he's just like I'm just gonna yeah. I'm gonna he's like I'm gonna write a vampire story. I'm yeah. just gonna see what happens. And he made it his own, mm-hmm. and he he paid paid quite a bit of homage and respect to the genre itself while still being you know still making it his own. So nice, yeah. It's 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 a good it's a fun story. Yeah, and I'm I'm anxious to go back and and reread it or re listen to it if you're a stickler for that, but because. Mm-hmm. If you remember our our friends over at Castle Rock TV podcast that they they unfortunately shut down their podcast yeah. uh, a while ago, but they before they shut it down and everything they did a review of Salem's Lot because they wanted to go through um, a bunch of Stephen King stuff in the lead up to Castle Rock, mm-hmm. and I remember them they had a very good review of, of of Salem's Lot, and it kind of opened my eyes to some of the um I guess issues like the um. Uh, the 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 female lead in it. Um, I don't even uh, remember. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think it, it's Matt's love interest in it. I think it, I think the main character is Matt. Yeah, um, uh, she is underdeveloped and just kind of there. Yeah, but I just remember like thinking like, oh yeah, well I have fond memories of Salem's Lot, and I'd be interested to to revisit it with a more critical eye. Um, but yeah, <laughs> if uh, if you want to hear them, I think they still have their podcast online. Um, but yeah, Castle Rock TV podcast did a really good re- uh, review of that. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So their, their podcast is still available. It's a, the Castle Rock TV podcast. Uh, go and listen to their episodes from, from when they were active. They're, they're very good. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's my number 17. That's Tiny's number 16. 16. So my number 16 is, uh, Mr. Mercedes. Nice. I, yeah. I was wondering if that was going to make your list. And you know, it's interesting because I've read this book twice and we've technically reviewed it, but I'm holding on to the recording until we can review the other two. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also The Outsider. But uh, I wasn't too keen on it the first time I read it. Um, okay. But when revisiting it um, six months ago, um, <laughs> There's just something about Bill Hodges, the retired detective chasing a madman that just earns him a spot on the list. Yeah. Um, like I, like I said, I haven't read Finders Keepers or End of Watch, so I don't know if maybe it'll be interchangeable or I'll, I'll, you know, sub in one of those when I do uh, onto the list. But uh, I don't know. Just something about Mister Mercedes just kind of spoke to me. Um, some of the characters aren't King's best. <laughs> And one of my big sticking points is that there's – that the setting – because one of my favorite things about King is, you know, building a world and building a town and, and populating it with characters. Yeah. Um, Mr. Mercedes and I presume the entire Bill Hodges trilogy has just this nondescript municipal city that it's set in that's just – it 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 drove me a little crazy. It's in Ohio though, isn't it? It It is, but it's like – but they don't say it's like Cleveland or Cincinnati, exactly. Right, right? Exactly. Like there's there's one scene where um, Jerome says something to the effect of, um, "Oh, we need to call someone," um, and then and then like part of I guess narration I guess would be, uh, and then Jerome said the city's area code and then the phone number. Like, yeah, you're stretching so much, Stephen. Right. <laughs> um. But yeah. But above all else, I I just I love. Bill Hodges is a, is a very interesting character and also just the game of cat and mouse between him and Brady Hartsfield. Amazing. And I just love how disturbed Brady is. And I just think he's a very fascinating, interesting character. Absolutely. I I agree with that. It's, it's my, uh, number 12. Um, I, I agree. I think it's, I think it's the, the cat and mouse game if you will like you said uh mm-hmm. between Hodges and Brady Hartsfield I think okay. it's just cuz it's it's kind of like a it has a feel of like uh 
Clarice and Dr. Lecter kind of thing. And not, not to that extreme, right? but like a modern version of that, I guess. Um, but yeah, it kind of has a little bit of feel to it like mm-hmm. that. And, and just the whole, um, the, the the building a character of a madman mm-hmm. again it's similar to uh buffalo bill and oh yeah sounds of the lambs i mean he's just he's a nut and mm-hmm. uh, but a uh, very intelligent calculated nut nice. uh and he he was just a fun character i think bill hodges is just really he's just that that gruff cop that's not mm-hmm. necessarily like being a cop is what defines him um, yeah, you know, to to the point where he's very depressed at the beginning of the story, and mm-hmm. getting back into an investigation brings him out of his shell again, and stuff like that. And so, like that's that's a very standard thing for a mm-hmm. police officer. But just to see, again, to see Stephen King go to a very standard character or a yeah. standard genre and make it his own was really compelling. Yeah, um, and similar to what we were saying about Salem's Lot. Like, the way that Mr. Mercedes and, and the Bill Hodges trilogy, I, I presume, uh, kind of, kind of, it's like King is dipping his toes into this kind of noir crime story, mm-hmm. but putting his own unique spin on it. Right. Um, which is just, I, I'm all for it. Absolutely, me too. And yeah, um, spoilers from my list, but mm-hmm. Finders Keepers and End of Watch are not on my list. I was, I was um, wondering. Yeah, they're not on my list, but they they're both solid books and mm-hmm. they're they're a good a good bow or a nice trilogy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would you be willing to listen to them again or read them again? Probably not. Okay. <laughs> uh so should I go on to my number 15? Yes. So my number 15 is a book that I covered with a uh, friend of the show Tony Troxel in episode 12 of the podcast. Uh it is The Dark Tower Book one, The Gunslinger. And this book will always hold a special place in my heart. Um, It's essentially the prelude to a journey that changed my life in the sense that it made me the King fan that I am today. Like, I obviously, we we wouldn't be doing this right now if it weren't for The Gunslinger and us reading The Gunslinger, I would say. Um. And just it's I, I, like the prose is so beautiful and I feel like it lays the groundwork for the series in this really compelling way um, while also having a very interesting narrative structure. Like because the way it's structured is that, it, you know, um, Roland tells a story and then Roland tells another story within that story or he hears a story from another person. And it's just it's kind of it's not convoluted per se, but it's it. I feel like it's an interesting way to t- introduce us to Midworld and, and uh, a world that has moved on. And not only is it interesting, but it also serves as a good introduction to one of the series' most pervasive themes or motifs, I guess, I don't know, uh, which is, you know, storytelling and the importance of storytelling and the different aspects of storytelling right yeah and then finally it also establishes roland as a character that is haunted by loneliness and demons nice so yeah good report oh thank you thank you <laughs> is that like a book report? um yeah, yeah this is what i did on my summer vacation <laughs> um yeah so obviously this is on my list too okay. uh is it, it in your top five it is not it's in, okay. it's in my six through six through 19 but i think okay. it would be a, it'd, it'd be a top tenner obviously yeah uh de- definitely yeah. um yeah I, <laughs> I said yeah but it's number 15 on mine <laughs> yeah um but yeah it's i i feel like the the gunslinger might be my second least favorite of the series of the series but mm-hmm. clearly um, it's mine <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but yeah it's it's i feel like it's hard to read having finished the whole series like going back to it because it's almost like out of place in the in the within the series Mm -hmm. because it's so it's it's so like non-linear or just so it's kind of uh i i have such a hard time describing the gunslinger it's compared to the other books because it's it's so like there's there's not a ton of dialogue the Mm -hmm. the story doesn't like drive really hard in points it's very it's a slow burn and it's 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 just kind of hard to read, frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. But when you, like you were talking about earlier with the threads tying together, all the stuff that ties back to book one, mm-hmm. the gunslinger is, 
it's really incredible how he wove it into the rest of the story. And, um, yeah, I, I just think it's, it's, it's the beginning of the journey. It's, it's what kicks mm-hmm. us off and it's, uh, it was originally written in installments right? in a magazine. So obviously there's going to be some fluidity issues there. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's so great because it's so, um, it's such a it's such a leap. It's such a dive into another world that you read certain aspects of it and you're like, I have to know more about this. Yeah. And that's that's what it does. It's, it's like you said, it's a great prelude setup. Mm-hmm. It makes you want to learn more. Right. And so that's that's the importance of the book and that's why I hold it in such high esteem. Same here. Yeah. Um and real quick, we uh, we do have confirmation that our friend Fekus, who is uh, under contract to read the Dark Tower yeah. and to review it with us, he has finished The Gunslinger. Mm-hmm. And so my plan has always been to – the plan has always been to have Tony do one-on-one book reviews of each book with me or like or like you, we can all three do it. Mm-hmm. And then like in between those reviews, have Fekus on – to review them in more detail, like more segmented. So like the gunslinger would be, we would talk about chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five, like the different sections and go more in depth while Tony's would be more of a broad, like, Oh, this is how I felt about the book. Okay. And, yeah. And then my whole idea was to have them come together in a, in a, in a third episode for each book where they would talk about like how they feel about it and stuff. Gotcha. I don't know. But anyway, that's pretty, bro- that's a lot of plans. It is. It is. Yeah. Yep. Um, a lot of <laughs> balls in the air. Yeah. Uh, so suffice it to say, we will have Fekas on, uh, soon to talk about the nice. gunslinger. Um, but yeah, so, so yeah, that's, that's a gunslinger. Um, mm-hmm. shall we continue? Yes, please. Okay. Number 14 on my list is a book that we reviewed in episode 10 of the podcast. The Dead Zone. Nice. Um, which I still can't get over how prescient it is. <laughs> like, in terms of the politics and everything, it is so bizarre to read it and equate it to what has happened in our world in 2016 to present day. Right. <laughs> um, um, but even with that, like, like, that's not the only reason why I have it on the list or I have it, uh, reasonably high up, I guess. 14 is, is not necessarily high up, but, uh, the reason why it ranks on my list is that Johnny Smith, such a tortured soul, burdened with this power that he didn't want, um, and it compels him toward a very organic end, uh, climax to the book that is so, so, like, a Stephen King thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just, I, I, I was so engrossed with it. Um, which I just remembered, uh, you didn't, you, you read the physical copy. Uh, yes. Yeah. Cause you borrowed my copy. Another, uh, voice actor, uh, who does the narration that's, that stands out is James Franco. Oh, he does the, the dead zone. Yes. Ah, oh, nice. So good. Very good. Yeah. So good. Okay. Um, my God, he he's so good. Okay. Um, but yeah, the dead zone and uh, so uh, tiny. A is this on your list? And B is it in your top five? Uh, it's on my list. It's not in my top five. Okay. Because I figure that if we come to one of your top fives, we can skip over it and we can okay. you can talk about it when you get to the top five. But anyway, go ahead. It it used to be a t- it was my favorite King book for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, I it's sitting at number eleven uh, okay. arbitrarily on my list. So, um. I, I think what's really remarkable about the book, uh, we obviously reference our, our review of it, but uh, I think I think what's so incredible about it is that given that it's a supernatural story, mm-hmm. uh, and there's this you know this guy has powers basically, it's incredibly grounded. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's almost like you can accept right off the bat that this guy can like see the future and he has these abilities where he touches someone and he can you know get something from them about their life. Like that's, that's, it's almost like, okay, that's a thing that happens. Like that's, it's (laughs) almost like you buy it. And like that, the premise is not hard to, it's not hard to pick up and it's not, it's so, it just feels so natural. It feels like it's such a natural part of the world that he builds that it's just like, it's, it's, that's not, that's not present in a lot of other 
supernatural horror books or sci-fi ish books, you know, um, like it is in this. Um, and I think it's, it, it goes back to the, you know, the, the, the incredible character work that he does. Yeah. Um, even though a lot of his characters are just kind of every man, ordinary people, um, mm-hmm. they, they feel they're, they're in these extraordinary situations and that's what makes them so incredible and so memorable. Uh, and, and Johnny Smith is really memorable for that reason. I, and I think the the fact that, his characters, I, I think he kind of he kind of has this fun. It's this fun thing as you're reading it because like uh, some of his ordinary characters that are thrown into extraordinary extraordinary situations, mm-hmm. sometimes they sometimes they overcome those situations and come out with a happy ending at the end or they whatever. But like a lot of the times they crash and burn really hard yeah. or they they turn up going to an extreme the way that Johnny Smith does in this or like I just read in Pet Cemetery the way that turns out mm-hmm. it's just really it's it, you never know what you're going to get and and I think it's as a king fan it's kind of fun to like play that game now like man where's this going to go you know how far is this character going to take this or you know it's it's really it's fun and it's a huge talent he has and I think it's on full display in the dead zone. And I, I think that's one of the first, this is that the dead zone is one of the first handful of King books I ever read. Mm-hmm. And so that really introduced that concept to me. And I, I kind of reference the dead zone a lot as, as, as like a, a, a staple of King isms, Stephen King isms. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so that's, it's, it's just, a, it's such a great example. Like if you, I think, if you had to tell someone like, you know, oh, like someone, someone's like, I've never read any Stephen King books. Like, what should I read? Where should I mm-hmm. start? Like, I think the Dead Zone is a decent place to start. No, totally. You know, I mean, th- there might be other books I would recommend before it. Mm-hmm. But if someone's like, well, my dad has a copy of the Dead Zone, I was just going to read that. I'm like, that's a great place to start. Go yeah. for it. It's a so. really good like introductory King yeah, novel, right? Um, yeah, and so we've reviewed the book and the movie on the podcast. And I just recently found out that all six seasons of the USA network show <laughs> is available on Amazon prime. So oh my gosh. You have your homework tiny. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've heard it's not great. Yeah. I, and it's, it's only loose. Things. It's only loosely based on. Yeah. That. Yeah. Which I think when we reviewed either the movie or, or the book, I was so into the idea of them doing like a three season show mm. that follows like him him and Greg Stilson slowly leading up to, to a confrontation or what have you. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be fun to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they can update it and like Greg Stilson could be like tweeting absolute nonsense and lying to everyone. Totally. Um, so (laughs) number 13, do you, do you mind if I can go for it? Uh, wolves of the Kala dark tower five. Nice. Um, my reasons are it's a great coming of age story for one character, even though he's not really, it's not like, that's not the prominent storyline of course, but I just love that the, that King put more time dedicated to that character, um, in his coming of age. Cause you don't get that character, uh, being that type of character. I'm being vague. <laughs> yeah. Um, also just, I am such a fan of, like when I was a snobby, pretentious teenager, my favorite movie was Seven Samurai because it was a three hour Japanese um <laughs> samurai movie that, you know, uh I wanted to be different. But I do love that story. And I love like the the story of Seven Samurai, Magnificent Seven, a bug's life. <laughs> yeah. And Wolves of the Kala feels like King's unique spin on that timeless story. Um and yeah. I just I I love it for that. Um, and then also just more of the stuff that it, that it does with the cotet, like there are rifts that form within the cotet, but at its heart, um, reflecting on it, it feels like it's maybe the best example we have and that the cotet themselves have, um, of seeing the quote unquote cotet of 19 working together the way that gunslingers worked before the world moved on. Mm. And I just, I, I love it for that because we don't necessarily get that throughout the series. Cause it's, you know, they're wandering toward the tower. Um, yeah. this, they actually stop. And even though it's a speed bump on the, on the road to the tower, it's really good character stuff. And, uh, it really brings home 
more kind of I wouldn't say abstract world building, but like um, it colors in some of the some of the world around traditions um, and stuff. Yeah, 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 exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so, is Wolves of the Kala on your list? It is, and uh, it's I have it sitting at number fifteen. Um, oh, nice! It's it makes me kind of a hypocrite because <laughs> my criticism of Songs of Susanna is that it's very toilish and it's. Mm-hmm. It's uh, a bump, a bump in the road. It's a stop in the road, and it, I feel like the the story came to a bit of a halt with it. Um, not a halt, but it slowed down so much that I was disenfranchised with it. But uh, sure. Wolves of the Kala is like the definition of toil because they literally <laughs> stop their journey, mm-hmm. um, and it's not to tell a, a background story. Um, you know, it's it's to help these people, and and it's 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 definitely toil but for whatever reason uh actually for a lot of the reasons you stated Mm -hmm. i really like this book i think the first time i read it i was a little disappointed that it was just such a stop in the road just such Mm a i was like man i really wanted him to keep going i feel like they're getting so close yeah um uh but the second time i read it i really loved it Mm -hmm. and and i think it's just because there's so many so many storylines so many there's so many balls in the air and and I feel mm-hmm. like this story, this fifth book adds to some of those, and there are some more balls added to the air. Mm-hmm. But I feel like I just feel like it really answers a lot of questions, mm-hmm. and it builds like just about like like you said like the traditions of what a gunslinger would traditionally do. Yeah, and and like you said, the cotet acting as a cotet. That's how they used mm-hmm. to be before the world moved on and it just it has it feels like um it it just kind of feels like a throwback story almost you know it's it's got this such such this great western feel to it um it's one of the more westernish parts of the series Mm -hmm. um and that's that's such a fun genre yeah to to play with um and they call attention to it in such a such a cool way like they talk about like um i I mean it's not really spoiler but like the the settlement that they're protecting in, in Wolves of the Kala is Calabrin Sturgis, which is right. named after uh, John Sturgis, um, the filmmaker. And like, they call attention to that. It's, it's yeah. just, it's a nice homage to uh, spaghetti Westerns. Right. Right. Yeah. And I feel like um, they're there for like, what's the timeline? Are they there for like two weeks? It's something, it's kind of short. Um, yeah. It's, it's at least a week. Yeah. Yeah, um, but but it, my point is, it feels um, there's this sense of urgency throughout mm-hmm. it, which is really, it really kind of blows me away that I feel like because it's so much of this book is palaver. It's them, yeah. It's the cotet and the town pe- townspeople talking and deciding how they're going to deal with this issue mm-hmm. and and a ton of other things as well. Yeah. Um, you know. I don't want to spoil anything, but it's just, it's so, it's amazing that there's so much talk and so much dialogue that it's like, this should be boring, mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's not. And like, I should, I should consider it toy, unnecessary toil and it should bother me. But for whatever reason, it doesn't. I, I think it's just because there's so, because even though it's toil, a lot of the characters, um, the quartet, are dealing with some heavy internal struggles. Yes. This is oh, like yeah. one of the most internalized Mm -hmm. struggle parts of parts of struggle throughout the series because it's so each character has their own really heavy stuff that they're dealing with which that's true throughout the whole season but i feel like it just bottlenecks into collar and sturgis i think it's because they're they're taking a bit of a break to the journey Mm -hmm. and so so many things have the opportunity to rise to the surface totally and so a lot of a lot of internal conflict arises from that yeah and like it also introduces the concept of the dry twist that roland has right right um mid-world arthritis yeah (laughs) (laughs) but it's like it's just it's it's the start of him really uh the the journey really taking a toll on the character and him feeling that like him being that old uh grizzled um gunslinger uh with many 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 (laughs) thousands of wheels behind him (laughs) yeah um so I, i i love it for that and yeah that's why it's my number 13 nice um, shall I continue to number 12? Please do. All right. So this is a book that I reviewed, I think, solo on episode 13 of the podcast. Christine. Nice. Uh, yes. Teen jealousy, cars, girls, death. 
<laughs> it's cool stuff. Um, more specifically, I love the bitterness of Arnie Cunningham and how Christine changes him is just really compelling storytelling to me. And the structure of the book is really appealing to me as well. Cause, um, again, I'm a sucker for the way King can unravel a story. Um, I talked about that with the gunslinger, but like with Christine, it's like, it takes a third person perspective, um, in the first and third parts of the book. But the second part, if I'm remembering correctly, is all from the, from the first person perspective of, of Dennis. So it's just really interesting because you get the, you get a viewpoint of Arnie Cunningham as he is taking possession of (laughs) Arnie Cunningham as he's taking possession of Christine in the first act. And then you get Dennis, his best friend's perspective throughout the middle part and then you get the third part, which is a more broad uh, back to the third person perspective as Christine takes possession of Arnie Cunningham. And it's just, I love that as a narrative structure and in the way that he tells a story. Nice. Um, yeah. And just, like I said, teen, teen jealousy, cars, girls, death, very cool <laughs> stuff. Um, uh, is Christine on your list? It is. Yeah. Uh, I have it sitting at number seven, um, nice. arbitrarily, but, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I we we talked about it uh, when we did the movie review. I don't think I was on the book review. Yeah, right. Because I haven't read the book in years. This mm-hmm. it was one of the first King books I ever read. Nice. Um, it's I really love it. Um, just because I I think I talked about it in the in the review of the movie, but I think the concept of a teenage kid getting his first car yes. is just so relatable. I mm-hmm. loved my high school car. Freaking loved it. Ninety five Monte Carlo. Which, oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, and like, oh man, the guy who bought it from the factory was like a doctor, okay, and so he got it like fully loaded and put like a twelve disc CD changer in it. Nice. Really dating myself there, um, <laughs> and it, it was like a fully loaded car, and it was just, I just loved that car, and like it's funny now because I, I can't stand cars, like I'm a truck SUV person now. Oh yeah, like I rode in a car this weekend and I was like, this sucks. It's so low <laughs> to the ground. I need a crane to get out of this damn thing. Mm-hmm. So it's just funny thinking back, but like it's just. The free the freedom attached with having a car when you're 16 years old is like, it's just one of those it's it's just one of those one of a kind things like yeah oh, and yeah. and just I think I I'm a car guy to a certain extent and I think the Plymouth Fury is an awesome car oh yeah um and I just I don't know I I like the like you said the the jealousy the girlfriend stuff the car yeah. stuff it's all just it's so thematic yeah uh in such a satisfying way mm-hmm. um. I, I really love Christine. I really love the movie yeah. too. Oh my god, the movie's it's so, good. so much fun. Yeah, I mean John Carpenter. John Carpenter, yeah, a legend. Dude's a bro. Oh yeah, dude is a bro. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, so yeah, so shall I go to my number eleven? Please do. All right. So number eleven is Pet Cemetery. Oh, nice. And my notes because I was in a hurry because you were on your way over. Uh, Grief, regret, pain. Um, <laughs> this book, oh my god! Like I'm, I've I've toiled with like what um, what order to put this in, but like Pet Cemetery, and I've talked about this on the podcast before. I won't go into much detail about it, but that first I've read it twice now. At this point, the first time I read it, I was at work and I nearly lost my composure <laughs> and nearly like started crying uncontrollably. Because the writing is so powerful, um, and we will talk in much more detail in the coming weeks, but um, just Lewis Creed's um, arc throughout the book is rooted in so much pain and grief that I just can't read it without being affected by it. Mm-hmm. And there is one passage that is, I would say, of the 30 books I've read by Stephen King, it may be the most haunting and beautiful passage I've ever read. Wow. Like, hard stop. <laughs> um, it's, it's, so, it's so in touch with this, this feeling of grief and, and, and pain and just not, not being able to control things. It's like, it's such, uh, it's such a powerful, powerful book. And I just I, I adore it so much, and I kind of feel regret that I have it at number eleven. Nice. Um, yeah, so it's super fresh in your mind. Uh, yeah, um, super fresh. 
Is it on your list? Absolutely, and it's 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 a top ten. I have it sitting at fourteen, but um, it's, the, this is a top ten book, and I'd be surprised if it's ever out of my Stephen King top ten. Yeah, even if I read all fifty-seven books he's written mm-hmm. so far, or whatever it is. Um, I want to say seventy. I is it that many? I thought novels. Oh yeah, yeah. Not including uh, seventy includes the short story. Okay, yeah. Um, but I, um, I think it's going to stay in the top ten, and I think it's. Again, it's just the it's it's the ordinary man in an extraordinary situation because it mm-hmm. it makes the story so relatable. It's like uh, yep. you can <laughs> you can uh, th- there's some decisions without spoiling it that mm-hmm. Lewis Creed makes, and he he has to justify them to himself. Mm-hmm. And I think as he's doing that, he knows that they're bad decisions. And as the reader, you're like, this is a bad decision, mm-hmm. but you're like. I completely understand why he's doing it. Yep. And you're like, you can just relate to it. And you're like, I, I, I wouldn't make that decision, Mm -hmm. but maybe I would, if I was in that situation, like I've never been in that situation before. I have no idea if this opportunity was provided to me, Mm -hmm. if I would do that. It's like, I I really can't, it's, it's almost like it really, really makes you think as a reader, Mm -hmm. um, which is, is an incredible tool that uh, Stephen King employs with a lot of his stories he really makes you think and like puts you in you know if you're if, if you're a person who's ever been in a boring situation and you're talking to someone it's like hey man what would you do if you had a million dollars or like right. what would you do if you could what superpower would you have or something mm-hmm. like that you know like just one of those scenarios you think about or it's just one of those scenarios you throw around it's like mm-hmm. this book kind of is that yeah one it's of a those thought scenari- experiment it's a thought experiment yeah. for sure and uh Oof. It's a exploration or a experiment of morality mm-hmm. as, as well, um, and it's just really good. I loved, I loved the climax of the story and the denouement. Mm-hmm. Like the very last line of the book, I was like, ah, it's, ah, I just really, really loved it. Um, I and I'm, I'm, I know. I think we've talked about Stephen King and his relationship with endings. Yeah. Um, you know, he's, he's up and down on them. He thinks mm-hmm. that they're almost insignificant, if you will. I don't share that sentiment, but right. I think this is one of his best endings. I, you know, that's interesting. We will talk in more detail okay. when we review it. Yeah. yeah, we'll have to. Um, but yeah, man, it's just, it is one of the most haunting books uh, it in, is in absolutely yeah and like when i was listening to the story uh listening to the audiobook um there was a prologue to it uh that he had written i think it was for maybe like an anniversary publication mm-hmm. of pet cemetery and he he said that a lot of people will there you know that he has his his huge stories like the shining and the stand and it and maybe one or two others that like really stand out that like people who aren't even Stephen King fans are aware yeah. of these stories. So he gets asked about those the most, but one of the other ones that he gets asked about the most is pet cemetery. Mm-hmm. And he considers it to be arguably one of his most terrifying stories. Yeah. And, and I, I agree just because of the weight of it, mm-hmm. not, not necessarily because it is literally scary as in something's jumping out and scaring you right. or something's going to get you. It's not, mm-hmm. not necessarily in that sense, but just the situation, mm-hmm. uh, situational horror, if you will. Absolutely. Yeah. Like it has some of those like external evil kind of thing, like kind of, kind of at play there, but at its heart, it, it is a story about like the horror of the story is in the character's actions and yes, the character's yeah. justification for those actions. Absolutely. In like, it's not the things that go bump in the night. Exactly. That are scary. It's, yeah, really, yeah. It's, it's not the things that go bump in the night. It is the things that cause a person to go and make those bumps in the night. Yes. There you go. Um, well said. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, it was kind of a reach, but anyway, <laughs> um, but yeah. And to go back to, I think when we were talking about Salem's lot where you mentioned that, um, you know, you can create, like you mentioned at one point in this recording that, um, with pet cemetery, he doesn't really paint like a very descriptive picture of Ludlow, Maine or anything, mm. which I agree, but, there's something about it. Like both times I've read it, like I have such a vivid image of their house and the Crandall's house and yeah. the street. Like it's so like vivid to me. That's true. So do I. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Man, I think so it's because I travel because in the in the story it's the fictitious Route 15 mm-hmm. uh, in Maine, and I I travel on a lot of Route 15s. Oh yeah, around Indiana and Illinois for work. I go to these tiny little towns that most mm-hmm. people never heard of, um, and uh, are they t- like Stephen King towns? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I love um, that. Covington, Indiana. I was out there recently. It's like. 10 miles from the Illinois border. Mm-hmm. Um, tiny little town, like less than a thousand people. It was very, uh, very Stephen King ish. Mm-hmm. And I, th- I, I usually think of Stephen King stories when I go through those kinds of towns. Same uh, here. Yeah. Like when I talked about song of Susanna and going down to Evansville to visit Mike for his baby shower. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember like I stopped at a gas station or something cause I had to go to the bathroom and I wanted to get like a drink and like, it was just in this kind of, you know, Blink and you miss it town mm-hmm. that is so like Jerusalem's lot or uh, to a lesser extent Chester's Mill. Like like just towns that feel like they have that energy, that Stephen King kind of thing. Right. And I just imagine like what if I what if I am the what if I'm a character in a Stephen King novel <laughs> and I'm walking into this and like some crazy shit's about to happen. Right. Um <laughs> hasn't happened yet, but well, if you're a teacher or a writer, you're probably going to end up in a Stephen King story at some exactly. point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which was interesting about Pet Cemetery that the main character was a doctor. Right, yeah. I wonder why he went that route. Because typically, that character would be a teacher. Oh, absolutely. Or, or a writer. Moving absolutely. to a new town to go to a new, to work at a new school. Which is interesting because like, he works at a university. Yeah, so, right. Yeah. But he's a doctor. I don't know. Right. It's just interesting. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, so yeah, so we will talk in more detail about Pet Cemetery. Did we? Did I interrupt you in the middle of? No, no, we're good. Okay, cool. Uh, but yeah, that'll be in the coming weeks. Um, God, my lunch stinks so bad. Yeah, what is that? It's chicken and rice. Oh, okay, it yeah. doesn't smell bad. It did, well, I mean, it yeah, it smells chickeny, but it smells like food. Yeah, yeah. It is pungent or it uh, is strong. It is aromatic. Mm-hmm. There you go. The sars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we are into the top ten um, at the, at this point. Yeah, top ten list. Um, nice. I think you have eleven more. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, because you didn't have Song of Susanna on your list. Right. But anyway, my number ten is The Dark Tower Four, Wizard and Glass. Um, it is a beautiful love story and a fantasy story that happens to tell vital backstory about King's most haunting character. And we get, like, it's not only his coming of age. Um, it's not only his first outing as a gunslinger with his first quartet. It is recounting a horrific moment for him and a, a series of horrific moments and telling the genesis of his, of his relationship with the tower and his first inclination of that. Um, and I just, I, I really had a hard time getting into it the first time I read it. I remember this was a book that I started reading, um, and then this was the longest it took to read one of the Dark Tower books. Um, I don't know why, because rereading it, I adore it so much. Nice. Um, but yeah, it is just a beautifully told story, and um, that, yeah, I, I, I love it. Charlie nice. Tree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, where is it on your list? Uh, I have it set at number eight, but it it would be okay. a top ten, I think. Nice, It'd probably be a top ten. Um, yeah, I I agree. I think um, uh, Roland Deschain is my favorite Stephen King character. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this story, this book is like what six seven hundred pages. Oh, uh, I think it's like yeah, about six seven hundred, maybe yeah. eight hundred. Okay, so it's yeah. basically. Roughly five to six hundred pages of backstory for one right. character, and that's that's just like, first of all, that is a bold decision to make. <laughs> it really <laughs> it's is a bold move, Cotton. We'll see if it plays mm-hmm. out. Um, to make in the middle of your series, and mm-hmm. and like when I first uh, learned that that's what this book was. I was like, I don't know. I, again, you know, it's 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 a it's a stop. It's a stop putting a stop to the story. Right. And so I'm like, I I don't know how much I like that. But even even the first time I read it, I was like, I man, I just absolutely loved it because it's mm-hmm. the story within the story is just so good and so remarkable that it it deserves its own book. Oh, absolutely, it really deserves its own book, e- even if it is just to 
serve the purpose of developing one character. I, mm-hmm. I think it's absolutely worth it. And it's, it's, I mean, the, the, the story is like, it's scary. It's beautiful. It's romantic. It's, uh, it's, it's dramatic. It's sexy. It's all these mm-hmm. things. Like it's got so many things working for it. It's, it's a really traditional story. Um, Mixed into the Dark Tower universe, mixed into Midworld with mm-hmm. with a nice Midworld spin, if you will. Oh yeah, um, it's it's just it's a really satisfying story. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's so it's so visual too. Uh, that's one of the things I feel like I like I have a, uh, a mental image of what um, the town of what Magus was like. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I feel like I just have a good mental image of it. Um, again, it's a very Western, mm-hmm. very Western story. Just so satisfying on so many levels, and I'm a bit hypocritical because um, I, when we were in high school and we read Romeo and Juliet, mm-hmm. I didn't like that story that much. I thought it was overrated. One of the reasons being that they're like children. Oh yeah, they're like 14 years old, and I was like, even when uh, when we were reading that story in high school, we were like 14 years old, and I was like, they're fucking kids. Like, let's mm-hmm. calm down here. Like, this is not one of the greatest love stories ever told. Right. They just wanted to bang her. Let's calm down here. But that's how I felt about Ju- Romeo and Juliet. Right. But did Romeo have blue bombardier eyes? Though he didn't. Let's though. let's be real here. Blue bombardier steely eyes. Yep. He did not. <laughs> so, but so I'm a bit of a hypocrite because it's 14, 15 years old in this mo- in this story. Mm-hmm. Um, but I honestly, I kind of feel like Stephen King sto- sold the story a little better. Yeah. Or sold the relationship <laughs> a little bit better, to be honest. So, eat your heart out, Bill Shakespeare. Yeah. Is the official position of the Tower Drinking <laughs> Yes, the official position. S- Stephen King <laughs> is better than William Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, God. Uh, yeah, so that that's, that's Wizard and Glass. God, I love it so much. And I love so the um, adaptation of it in the comics. Um, just yes, really definitely. Great. Oh yeah, that was. I'm glad they visualized that story. Absolutely, the visuals are incredible in that book. Oh yeah. Um. So next up, uh, number nine is um, <laughs> uh, Dark Tower Three: The Wastelands. Nice. Um. I, the reason I have this rated so or ranked so high, is because of of a few reasons. One, it is some of the coolest world building in the Dark Tower series. Yes. Um because the gunslinger is Roland wandering the wasteland uh, meeting Jake. Drawing of the 3 is him uh jumping between worlds and everything. Uh the wastelands is the coming together of the quartet as well as <clears throat> the most arguably the most backstory and world building of midworld that we get true like yeah. everything like um just like the, the lud lud, lud is yeah. incredible um and then we also get you know the the house demon um yeah <laughs> we get uh, like uh, there's so much that's so memorable about the wastelands for me um gasher and the tiktok man just just so much stuff like the relics of the of of uh of the old people i guess but it's just it's so it's so vivid and so dense with just world it it felt like stephen king was he he did the gunslinger he did the drawing of the three and then he's like all right let's just let's go full mid world let's 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 fucking do it yep um bring and out I, the big guns exactly pun intended <laughs> nice um it's just i i love it so much um is it on your list? It is. I have nice. it sitting arbitrarily at position 19. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, it's up there for all the reasons you said. I, th- I think, again, just everything that happens in Lud mm-hmm. is so... It's a super rich book because there's so many so many speaking parts. And um, I feel like we get one of the first glimpses into the prestige of a gunslinger yes when they go through the like little suburb town or whatever yeah, inside the, i can't remember i don't remember the um, name of the town after i just said oh it's such a vivid story yeah <laughs> right but where uh it's aunt talitha is that the i believe so I yeah i believe so um but yeah that's a yeah. that's that's like a it's like a, um a, a peek back in time without actually doing a flashback Mm-hmm. Um, or a memory of Rollins or something like that. So I think it's, I, I love that part. And then just everything that happens in Lud because it's so like that, 
that town and the events that take place there with the quartet mm-hmm. are so so like anachronistic almost and like um it's just it's like it's like a clash the the clash of modern technology and all the north central positronics and robotics and all that stuff mm-hmm. with the starkness of the like the western genre i guess the mm-hmm. clashing of those two things and the how they have to work together like sh- it shouldn't work like it shouldn't make sense but it ends up being really fluid and like and really drawing you in i think uh drawing of the three you in um <laughs> no but it really it really it just it really works from the reader's perspective i i think it's and I can't even put my finger on it. Um, and I think I think part of it is the full culmination of the Kotek coming together. That's part yeah. of it. You get that super sentimentality uh, as as the reader seeing them all together at once and really just like, oh my god, there they are. Um, <laughs> yeah, it just kind of has that feeling to it. And then it's it's like immediate um, immediate controversy or like immediate uh, action. Like boom, mm-hmm. like they're together and then boom, they're in blood and they have to. Yeah overcome they get separated again and it's like oh right. damn it and it's it, like it's just so compelling it's mm-hmm. so i feel like once they get to the city and they start crossing that bridge mm-hmm. the story is like really a rocket ship or oh, a, a bullet train taking off if you will <laughs> a bullet train with an annoying voice <laughs> um yeah i just there's so many so many incredible things in the wastelands absolutely and yeah. uh that town was called river crossing river crossing okay. and Again, like, yeah, it, it's got so much, like, this has so much stuff in it. Um, yeah. Shardik, the bear. Right. Introduction of the beams. Uh, the guardians of the beams. Mm. We've got, uh, uh, um, uh, it playing with paradoxes in such yeah. a fun way that is so in tune to, like, my science fiction sensibilities. Yeah, totally. Um, just such a great book. Mm-hmm. I, man, I love it. Um, yeah. Uh, so should I continue? Please do. All right. Number eight. Uh, and this is, this is a book that I haven't read since 2013. Um, Under the Dome. Nice. Okay. Yes. Which outside of it, the novel it, um, Under the Dome is my absolute favorite example of King creating a world, in this case, Chester's Mill, Mm-hmm. And then creating conflict amongst its characters against the backdrop of a supernatural event, like just and and Big Jim Rennie is one of the great villains of the Stephen King oeuvre. Yes, and I also kind of wonder if it would be kind of prescient a little bit, <laughs> um, the way that uh, the Dead Zone was. But I just remember just really falling in love with Under the Dome, and there's a lot of stuff about like the ending and people didn't like the ending. I thought that it was great. Um, maybe not as strong as some of his other endings and everything, but it was still just a very satisfying read for me. And, um, the other, he has this really great way of, of making an expectant of, or, or not necessarily foreshadowing, but, leading up to an event. So like there, I remember vividly, there is a, there's a climactic thing that happens in under the dome shocker in a fiction book there, the fictional book, there's a climactic moment, (laughs) but like the way that like, I remember being filled to the brim with suspense and just like so freaked out. Cause it's a thousand page book. Right. I'm on page like 800 or something. I've known these characters and I know, oh my God, they are in mortal peril right now Mm -hmm. and they don't know it. Um, just so great. And it's my, my feelings for under the dome and my appreciation for the novel is undercut so much by my disappointment in the show. Yeah. Um, which was one of my least favorite Stephen King adaptations. Fortunately, you know, other things have taken the reins there. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, I, I still think to this day, I still think that a proper adaptation of under the dome could be the closest thing to lost. Like, Oh yeah, the, totally. Yeah. That was like my whole excitement for under the dome. Like it has that appeal to it. So anyway, that's my number eight under the dome, tiny 
your list? Yes, no? Yeah, it is on my list, uh, sitting at 17. Um, nice. Yeah, I... I well said. I I agree. I oh, think it's you. it's it's funny because like it's a stupid idea for a story. <laughs> I mean, it's it's like this. They jokingly did it in The Simpsons. Yeah, uh, it was a joke in The Simpsons. It's it's a, it's a silly idea. <laughs> um, and I think a lesser person pitching that idea to a producer or a publisher, or whatever, mm-hmm. they'd be like, "Get out of my office!" Right. But of course, Stephen King can pull it off. Right. And, and it's you, you think it's a story about a dome being smashed down on top of a town and these people being trapped in this town. Mm-hmm. Like you think that's what the story is about, but it's not, it's about this tyrant who runs everything right. and it's, it turns into this whole political criminal conspiracy thing. It's that's more of what drives the story than the actual dome. Yep. And like, that's, that's hard to do. It's hard to pull that off in a story. And that's what Stephen King does so well. Oh, and yeah. th- this is a book that, Again, I think this would be a kind of a fun place for someone to start getting into Stephen King. That would be really interesting. It'd be a fun place because oh, it's, yeah. it's a fairly recent book he's written, mm-hmm. um, and it's it's not really connected to any other universes. Yeah, that's true. As far as I know, um, yeah. But it's but it's very Stephen King in that mm-hmm. it's so so character driven and it's a lot of subtext and subplot is is really the king of it all or really the focus of it um it's it's just a great king book it's it's stephen king doing stephen king really hardcore absolutely and it's it's fun as hell oh yeah it's a, like you said it's a thousand pages it does not feel like no it. it you breeze through it absolutely i read it in like a week nice which is fast for me oh, so yeah. yeah um man it would be so cool if hulu like got the rights to it and i know made it. my mom and dad both read it my mom read this book in like two days Oh yeah, because my mom reads super fast, anyways. Mm-hmm. Um, but they were both super excited for this, the TV show and stuff too. And yeah, they nice. hated it. But it was, I, I remember, I have fond memories of recounting the book with my parents. Nice. And, yeah, it's a good one. Sweet. So I think my next like three, my next several are all in your top five. But do you just want to just continue doing the way we're doing it? Does That's it fine. Yeah. On your top five. That's okay. fine. So my number seven is a little book called The Shining. Nice. And, I mean, it was my first King book. Um, Absolutely terrifying. The Overlook Hotel is one of King's greatest villains. Yes. Um, And just the way that it slowly unfurls. Like, all of the stuff that happens in the book is, like, it's like a conventional, like, horror setup. A haunted, it's a haunted house story. But you get the drama of Jack Torrance with like alcohol withdrawals, like being seduced by the hotel Mm -hmm. to the point where he is, you know, uh, driven to do despicable, horrible things and become a threat. It's corrupted by the hotel. Corrupted, yes. Yeah. And it's just so, it's so great. Like, I remember, I I remember, um, I think I was. No, I wasn't. I wasn't listening to the audiobook, so I would have been reading it on Kindle. But like, I remember working like third shift at well, the building I work at, and a different. You know, I work for the actual company now. But like working overnight, reading it on my Kindle, and like being terrified of it, mm-hmm. um, because you know, overnight it's it's nighttime, it's scary. Yeah. Um, but in like, I, I started listening to the audiobook just for, just for shits and giggles, uh, cause I finished Pet Cemetery last night and I started the, I started the audiobook and I was in my, in my apartment, pitch black, lights were out. I was in bed listening to it and stuff. And like, I remember I had to like go up, get up to go to the bathroom or something. And I remember like just having like a visceral feeling of like, what if I looked into my living room and I saw someone sitting on the couch? Yeah. Like it was just so like rooted in me and it's just mm. like that's something only the shining can do to me yeah <laughs> um just so so good and yeah. so just so rich mm-hmm. um yeah uh it's it's a beautiful beautiful book <laughs> yeah, absolutely yeah uh you talk now <laughs> yes so this is in my top five it's my number four nice and that Very is nice. that is a hard four mm-hmm. um I think I think this book is so largely responsible for 
the common perception that Stephen King is a horror writer and nothing else. Yes. You know, like you you said where someone once saw you, they were like, hey, what are you reading? And you were reading a Stephen King book and they were like, ooh, scary. And you were like, right. not really. No. Because no. that's it's it's a kind of a misnomer or a mm-hmm. mislabel sort of with, yeah. with Stephen King. And I think this book is not entirely, but largely responsible for that. Totally. I, th- I think it's because everyone... I think most people throughout their life were afraid of the dark at some mm-hmm. point. Some people still are. Uh, some people in this room still are. <laughs> Same here. It's the dark, man. It's yeah. scary. It's scary. <laughs> it's the unknown. But um, and so I feel like there are a handful of moments, but most notably the visit to room 217 in this book mm-hmm. that is like untouchably scary. Like it's oh, yeah. like – the biggest badass person you can imagine, like Dwayne the Rock Johnson, mm-hmm. would read that moment of this story and be freaking scared, right? Yeah. Like that's that's that is the heart of why this is a great book. But that heart leads to many other organs of why this is a great book. I guess it's right. a terrible analogy, but um <laughs> Because I, 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 the reason I say that is because when I've only read this book one time, mm-hmm. I was thirteen. I was in seventh grade, and I actually read it for school. I think uh, seventh grade English, we just had to pick a book. I don't even remember what the assignment was. I think it was like maybe it was a set list of books. I really don't remember. Okay. But The Shining was there, and I was like, I, you know, I've I've gotten into Stephen King. I'm going to read. I'm going to read The Shining. It's like nice. one of his most, arguably his most famous book at the time. Maybe I don't know. Yeah. Um, is this before or after your summer of King? Were this you- was after. Okay. Freshly gotcha. after, like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had I had written like re- read Christine, Misery, and Cujo. I think okay. before this, and that was nice. like a few months before this. Um, so I was like, I'm going to keep going with the Stephen King thing. I can do it for school. This is awesome. And so, school reading assignments. It's like, oh man, it's due tomorrow. I got better read. I better read this thing. You right. know, it's like you don't really. There, there are the occasional, uh, uh, you know, exceptions to that. But normally, it's like I, it's school. It's an assignment. I'm not into this. I'm not. I'm not into the story. But right. with The Shining, it's one of the few books that I read for a, a class or for school where I finished it before it was due. Nice. And like I couldn't put it down. Another one was 1984. Okay, love that book. Couldn't put it down. I read it before it was due. Um, but this, I stayed up. The part where Danny Torrance. Visits room two seventeen. Yes, not going to spoil it or not going to go into it at all. But I right. hope most people listening to this probably know what that is. Mm-hmm. Um, I stayed up till like midnight to read. I couldn't put the book <laughs> down, and that happened to be the part I was at. So I stayed up till like awesome. midnight to read it, and I didn't fall asleep till like three or four in the morning because I was uh, so fucking scared. That's so awesome. That was so like such a v- visceral fear mm-hmm. from reading that. Oh my god! Just the sound of the footsteps and just oh, it's so freaking scary. Uh, I have literal goosebumps right now. <laughs> um, that's for me. That's what I think of when I think of this book. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because I haven't read it. It's been more than half my life since I read this right. book. I really need to read it again. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's, I mean, there's so many other great things about the book. I yeah. like, like you said, the setting, mm-hmm. um, being that it's isolated in the mountains and stuff like that. The isolation of the book is a super powerful theme. Mm-hmm. Um, ah, man, the history. I, I love where uh, Torrance, uh, Jack Torrance, like spends a lot of time like reading the history of the totally. Overlook. Totally, so fascinating. I love it. Um, there's so many incredible things in this book. I, I can't even. We will probably have to do a standalone review of it oh, at some point oh, oh, absolutely. on the podcast, and and I need uh, once I read it again, mm-hmm. I think I'll definitely be ready to do it. But, yeah, uh, it's such a good book, and yeah, and w- with The Shining, obviously, there's, I mean, that's that's going to be a fun project for us because we'll read The Shining, review it, mm-hmm. um, talk about the movie, probably. talk about the movie, uh, review that in a standalone episode, and then also I'll probably make you watch the 1990s. Uh, TV movie with Steven Weber. Okay, I've seen it. Yeah, nice. But it's been a long time. Yeah. And then, of course, we could probably plan this to coincide with, I think it's, is it next year? Or, I think it's next year, uh, Doctor Sleep. Right. It's coming out with Ewan McGregor. Right. Um, yeah, so we'll have to read that and then review that. It'll be, that'll totally. be fun. That'll be a yeah. fun project. Um, but yeah, oh, yeah, so that's my number seven. That's your number four? My number four. It's nice. In the top five. Um, your this next one is in your top five as well. It is my number six. It is the Dark Tower Seven, the Dark Tower. Nice. Um, I've never been more 
emotionally invested or devastated <laughs> by an ending, like the ending chapter of a series, like the ending, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A- ending, uh, publication of like the last, the last entry in, in a series. Mm-hmm. Um, just, I have such vivid memories of reading this book at, again, at work and having to put it down and being afraid to continue it because <laughs> I didn't want things to happen. I didn't want the story to end. I didn't want certain things to happen to certain characters. I didn't want, I didn't, I, I it was such a, like, I remember where I was, I, like the exact, like I could, I could take you to where I was and point you to the chair I was in <laughs> when I read uh, on this would have been July fourth, twenty thirteen, I think. <laughs> um, when I read a specific part of the book and was just devastated. Wow! And then when I reread it or re-listened to it, I can tell you exactly where I was <laughs> in the car on four sixty five, like I, the exact part I was because I was just like eh, just so affected by it. Um, and there are some bits and pieces here that don't really, that seem like King going a little too off the deep end a little bit here and there. Yeah. But just any criticisms I have about the Dark Tower book are assuaged by just the phenomenal character work and like what I think is, in my opinion, one of the best conclusions I've read um, absolutely or experienced mm-hmm. um just so satisfying on so many levels yeah um just god i love that book <laughs> and i love that series um where is it on your <laughs> i agree it's my number one nice this is my favorite stephen king book nice um and it's it's for the reason you just said it's mm-hmm. it is the conclusion i think again i think this is probably my favorite ending like it's mm-hmm. of of probably any book, but most of the stories I've experienced in my life through yes. film, TV, books, wherever, uh, this, this is probably a top five ending. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's, it is just think, think about the stories you've experienced throughout your life, whether it's a story someone told you again, or, or again, if it's, if it's a TV show, if it's a movie, mm-hmm how long were those journeys, you know, that you you took to experience those stories? I doubt that most of them were 4,000 pages. Right. You know, most of them weren't, you probably didn't spend years. You know, if if you followed these books from 1980, when the gunslinger came out right in publication, you're probably insane right now. You're probably in a nut house recovering. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, we read it over like a year and a half, a year. Yeah, uh, 13 months. 13 months for you. I yeah, think it was about the same for me yeah. somewhere in there. I think I, honestly, you finished it like a month before I did. Did I? Okay. Yeah. Like about a year. So just think of that. 4,000 pages over a year. That's such that's such a journey. It's, it is a mm-hmm. journey. It's not just a story oh, yeah. here. It's a journey you go on. And the way it ends is so great. It's mm-hmm. so good. I love the way it ended. It's... It's it's incredible. It's it's super tragic, but mm-hmm. and a lot of people don't like to feel that way. They want a happy ending or whatever. Right. I'm not a big fan of happy endings necessarily. Mm-hmm. I think it's I think life doesn't have a lot of happy endings a lot of the time and so right. it makes sense that it's tragic sometimes. And mm-hmm. some of the best endings are tragic. Uh and I just I love this one. I think it was I don't know why I enjoy having my heart ripped out right. at the end of the story, but I mm-hmm. do. It's so good. Uh, and that's, I mean, that just that reason alone makes it my number one, but there's so many other things to love about this. I mean, what happens to the Cotet again, it's, there's tragedy there. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's, it's just, it's satisfying. Like, I feel like it's, I feel like it's, realistic amongst yeah. this fantasy story it's it's what's supposed to happen it doesn't pull any punches right like right it yeah doesn't, i commend stephen king for being able to do the things that he did in it because i mean this is his magnum opus it is the story that he has been telling for the majority of his career right and he is able to not necessarily divorce himself from the characters in a way but like he isn't 
Like he loves these. Oh, I, arguably, he loves the characters more than anyone else because he created them. <laughs> right. And it's just the way that he like. It doesn't feel like he lets that get in the way of what needs to happen to the story. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, we'll get to that eventually. It's like a father killing his children. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it really. That's what it. That's sort of what it feels like. But yeah, yeah he doesn't. He doesn't write down to his audience like the way he right. would like talk down to someone yeah. he treats his audience with respect i think and the way he does that with right. the conclusion of the story is yeah. just incredible i i want to make a stupid jo- i'm not going to make it because it's a spoiler for a sitcom which is has nothing to do with this but anyway oh maddie yeah anyway so yeah dark tower is your number one yay yes it's my number six i feel like it should probably be number five but instead number five is and the, this is probably going to be interchangeable with with the Dark Tower now that I think about it. But Dark Tower Two: Drawing of the Three. Nice. It is the book that made me fall in love with, like, <laughs> the Gunslinger was my first date with <laughs> the Dark Tower. Uh, the Drawing of the Three was, uh, like meeting its parents. I don't. No, no, no. That's later. But um. <laughs> Like, I don't know. It, it, the drawing of the three. I can make a crude joke, but the drawing of the three was what hooked me on to the Dark Tower. Getting to first base. Um, yeah, sure. We'll go with that. <laughs> um, but just, I mean, God, the drawing of the three is the introduction of one of my favorite characters ever. Yep. Eddie Dean, uh, Edward Cantor Dean. Uh, and then coming off of the post-apocalyptic Western with sorcery, um, of the gunslinger into this world jumping adventure of like mind, not mind control, but like mind. I don't know how to, de- how to describe it, but all of these different things like control, like it's, it's, uh, I, I don't know how to describe it, but it just blew <laughs> my mind and it just opened my eyes to how massive and how fucked up the series was going to be. Yes. Um, it's just, it's so it's so great. It's also just the way that it begins, like the balls on Stephen King to make the second entry in this this very vast franchise open it up with the way that he does with the lobstrosities and with mm-hmm. Roland, and then puts he puts the character in the hands of a uh of a, of a heroin junkie yeah. on a plane. Like it's just, it's such a just out there crazy premise yeah. and it's so beautiful. And I, and I just, I love it so much. It has this momentum to it that wasn't as present in the gunslinger because the gunslinger is more, uh, ruminating and more thought provoking. And, and it's more about Roland just wandering the wasteland, his relationship with the kid, his, his choice with, with the kid, the kid or the tower, his palaver with the man in black, all of these things. And then we get this kind of awesome pseudo action thriller kind of thing. Um, that brings him into our world in a very unique way. It's just, it's such a cool book. Um, and then you get the introduction of Odetta slash Detta, which is so like, it adds so many more wrinkles to it. Yes. It's just so cool. I, I, man, I adore that book. Um, yeah. Drawing of the three is my number five. Okay. Yeah. Ironically, it's my number five too. Nice. Yeah. One huh. of my, one of my solid top fives. Um, Sweet. Yeah, everything you said, I agree with so much, and mm. you kind of took some of the words out of my mouth. Really? Oh, sorry. No, I mean that is a comp <laughs> or like that's a that's a compliment. Like I, I agree with with you so much. Mm. Um, yeah, I think it's I, I so many good things to say about this. I think it's uh, it's it's really this this feels like kind of the. Uh, this feels like more like the beginning of the journey mm. almost more than the gunslinger does. Yeah. Cause like you said, the gunslinger is almost like a prelude or a right. introduction, whatever. Um, and so this, this really feels like the beginning of the journey. And, and I agree with you so much about handicapping your lead character right. and the opening scene. It's like, mm-hmm. it's like, what are you doing? This is an action. There's a lot of action that drives this story and it's, mm. 
that's one of the genres this falls into is kind of an action story. It's like, holy crap, how do you how do you weave that into your story? That's such a crazy choice to make right off the bat, but it works so damn well. And it it just throws you onto the mercy of Eddie Dean and mm-hmm. Yeah, he's one of my he's one of the best characters ever as well. I, oh, yeah. I agree with you on that. So, um, yeah, I I lo- this this is my second favorite Dark Tower book as well. Um, the the Dark Tower being uh, my favorite, but um, yeah, I, and I think it's I think it's just it's it's like the team up. It's like the Avengers. Like this is the this is where <laughs> they get together and they start to become a team. And it's mm-hmm. uh, I love the whole. Uh, I just love the visual of being on this crazy journey. You're injured and you're stumbling along this beach with like hardly any hope mm-hmm. at all. And you come to a doorway. Yes. That visual, a freestanding, a door. freestanding doorway. Yeah. That's, you're just like, what WTF mm-hmm. question mark? Like that's that visual really grips me. And it's mm-hmm. like, and then you open it up and you, through these doorways, you have the ability to occupy the minds of others. Right. And just the whole, the whole alternate universes or mm. that's, those are just heavy themes to try to balance at once. Oh yeah. And King does it so well in this book. And he's just like, I feel like it's such a different, it's such a different shift from the gunslinger that it's almost like, wow, this is the same story as the gunslinger. Right. Um, but it's it's still true to the themes he established in the first mm-hmm. book, you know. And I, I think that's that's one of them is the the whole themes of these alternate universes and trying to navigate around that and how all these different like uh, the New York that uh, Eddie and uh, Odetta, Odetta and uh, Jake are all from mm-hmm. is so significant, even though. The tower is in Midworld, right? Like it's just—it's such a great way to make to to again kind of ground the story or mm-hmm. make it relatable or um, connect it, connect it all. Right. Yeah, it's yeah. it's such a it's just such a great beginning to the story, really, to the journey. I'll say totally not the story, but the journey. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. it's just awesome. I agree, um, and yeah, just <laughs> so stupid. But um, your point about the the doorway. Mm-hmm. And like it's such an iconic image of the Dark Tower series. Yes. And like it's just it's so it's so great. And the movie put it in a deleted scene, but that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um Yeah. Jesus Christ. Fucking uh movie. yeah, so we're coming up close to the end here. Yep. So I'm gonna go ahead and go with my number four. Okay. And that is the stand. Yes. Yes. This mammoth post apocalyptic horror road trip story (laughs) road captain trips Uh, Uh. um it's a story like the good versus evil aspect of it and how the different factions form out of these normal people that it's like they're thrust into this world ending fight of good good and evil it's it's so magnificent Mm -hmm. and it is probably the best example of king having these very clearly drawn three-dimensional characters who are flawed, both physically, mentally, just it's their, their flawed characters in this fight for the, for the world essentially. And it's just such a, it's some of the most engaging and thrilling characterization I've ever read from King. Um, like even the like little vignettes of it, like um um oh my god, why can't I remember his name? Larry. Larry in the in the tunnel is like a horror book unto itself. Yeah. And just uh even when the even when the plot slows down and we get to the boulder free zone and we have Pa- long passages of just minutes of their committee meetings. Right. It all builds toward again to one of the one of the best reading experiences I've had with King was the culmination of the Boulder Free Zone segment of the book. And it's like it's so it's just so spectacular. Um the way that he develops and then builds and then 
just uh just long enough keeps the tension going it's like it's masterful um and man i need to i need to read the stand again <laughs> nice um i've only read it i haven't listened to the audiobook so maybe that's what i'll i'll have to do soon but totally yeah it's oh my god it's so good um where's this land on your top five <laughs> uh it's it's my it's my number three nice yeah um this i read this uh, i read it twice um, and I have read the unabridged version or the the unedited updated and expanded. There you go, updated and okay. expanded. I've read that one twice, mm-hmm. which is eleven, almost twelve hundred pages. Yep, I think so. So it's a it's it's a marathon. Um, mm-hmm. and I think I think it unlike uh, under the dome. I think you actually feel all twelve hundred of those pages. Yeah, it feels like a marathon. It can be a slog. Yeah, yeah, but. It's a satisfying marathon. It's a satisfying mm-hmm. slog. I guess I want, I want all those details and all all that, all that meat. I guess I yeah. like I wouldn't have it any other way. I'll put it that way. Right. <clears throat> um. And 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 it's this this story. It's all about the characters. It's just which duh, but like that's 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 what I love about this book. I just love the characters even more so than the. Good versus evil, um, which which is just that that is that is the most standard traditional basis for a story is good and evil, mm-hmm. you know. And it's so in that respect, it's um this story has been told before, but it's never been told in this way, and it's never happened this way. So that's what makes it unique. But I feel like good and evil stories can just be so bland and just, you don't, you don't care about it. And I feel like your, your characters have to be so strong in order to make such a thematically common story really stand out. Mm -hmm. And the reason this story stands out so well is because the characters are so incredible and, and just the dynamics of the way that some of these characters are paired together as well. That's what really drives, the story, um, you know, you have these just two characters that you wouldn't think would go together, like a mentally challenged man and a deaf man or a mute man. Mm-hmm. Uh, deaf mute. Is he deaf mute? I think so. Yeah. I yeah. He can't so. speak or, and he's deaf. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But he can, he reads his lips. That's right. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. It's been a while since I read it. Right. Couldn't remember the exact details, but uh, like that, that's, that is an unlikely pair, um, mm-hmm. you know, and it, Again, that is a huge challenge as a writer to make that work. You have to, like, it's almost like, why would you make that much work for yourself as a writer to put those two together? But it just makes it all the more satisfying to have such a, a motley crew, I guess, of, mm-hmm. of, of these two characters paired together. Um, and there's tons of examples of that yeah. in, in oh, this yeah. book. It's, it's just really incredible how he, how he wove all this together. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, almost downplaying the story a little bit. I don't mean to do that because it is incredibly satisfying and mm-hmm. it's, it's a great, great example into the good versus evil genre. I, mm-hmm. I, I totally, I totally, uh, champion the book in that way. Um, totally. so I'm not trying to downplay that, but, uh, I feel like that's, that is just not the most interesting part of this book. It's the, right. inc- it's the incredible characters. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, it's, uh, it, it's his best cast of characters, which is it, saying something, because really on a Dark Tower podcast, you know, it, yeah. sh- it should be the quartet, but mm-hmm. they're a close second, I think. Uh, oh, yeah. But but this, I think this takes the cake, partly because of the volume of characters, yes, but also because of just like you said, the three three dimensions of each character mm-hmm. that's laid out in twelve hundred pages or whatever. Oh yeah, um, like uh, God, like Harold is such a fascinating character. Harold and uh oh wow, what is her name? Franny? I think Did I just make that up? No, I think you're right. Wow, we we are hosting a Stephen King podcast. We are <laughs> a little bit. I haven't read this in like 7 years. It's eight it's years. been a while for yeah. me. Do you remember or did I make this? I know I didn't make this up. Um, me, you, and Mike tried reading it as like, uh, like an emailing each other back and forth about it. Yeah, sections. that lasted like two emails. It did, yeah. It Fran did Goldsmith last. is her name. Fran Goldsmith, yeah. I, um, I'm pretty sure that's her name. Yeah, I'm almost positive you're right. But the, the triangle between them is, is so great. And then 
it what's great is like all of these little pieces are are just just there it's it's they're there but they're so well defined yeah um and you get like little vignettes like that you get you get that um uh, uh, the entire opening section of the book with the 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 travels of Captain Trips, the superflu, the way it connects and everything, like it's one of the most brilliant and haunting segments of the uh, Stephen King's entire career that I've read. Right, and it's like it's so vivid and like it's it's almost a cliche at this point, <laughs> but. If you have a runny nose when you're reading The Stand, it will freak you the fuck out. It will, yes. And it's just, yeah. And then, like, uh, uh, Trash Can Man in the prison, Uh like, that whole section stuck with me for several years. Mm -hmm. Um, God, it's such a good, it's such a good book. It is. Um, Yeah, I need to, and I'm super excited because I think, oh, uh, Grover... I was like Grover Cleveland, <laughs> um, Grove, Grover Gardner. He Grover Gardner uh, reads the audiobook for the stand, and I'm super excited because I read like uh, a book about Nazis that he narrated, and he was really good. <laughs> so anyway, um, and then finally, with the stand, Randall fucking flag, <laughs> the walking yeah, dude. I mean, absolutely. come on, uh, so good. Um, yeah, did you say where this landed on yours? That's uh, my number three. Is it okay? Yeah. Um, should we continue? Please. Okay. My top three. Do you have three left? I have four left. Four left. Okay. Um, oh, I'm very interested what the fourth would be. <laughs> huh. Uh, number three for me, Misery. Nice. Yes. Um, Annie Wilkes, one of King's most terrifying creations. Absolutely. Um, just so grounded in a reality that is so skewed and <laughs> disturbed um, that when, I mean, you feel for Paul Shelton, Sh- Sheldon, uh, for Paul. Um, but what I love about this book is that it's not a supernatural story at mm-hmm. all. It is completely grounded. But when reading it, like, uh, cause I've read it once and I was just blown away by it. And kind of knowing that it's not or or kind of coming to the conclusion that it's not a supernatural thing i found myself kind of attributing certain things to annie wilkes's persona and her actions that made for an even more fulfilling reading for me um and what i mean by that is that i viewed it as this very clear allegory for a creative mind battling um, uh, uh, their creative mind, <laughs> right? Um, uh, a creative mind battling its muse or creative process. So, mm-hmm. like, the whole point of the book is that he is he's made his living being a successful romance novelist. He wants to break free from that. Has his passion project that he wants to do. Here comes Annie Wilkes that rescues him and is imprisoning him and forcing literally forcing him to write what he no longer wants to write. Yeah. And it's such an incredible, uh, dissection of the creative process and, and like passion versus livelihood and passion versus, you know, what your muse wants you to do. Um, (laughs) it's just, it's such a beautiful and disturbing book. Yeah. Um, so freaking good. Um, yeah, Misery. Uh, wow, and, see, it's my number two. Interesting, nice. And you got a lot more out of this book than I did. Oh, really? Interesting. So this is another book that I haven't read since I was 13, mm-hmm. 12 even, I think. Okay. This is one of the first two, or, I can't remember if I read Christine first or this first, but okay. it was one of them. And I haven't read it since. Interesting. So I'm still filtering it through the mind of a 12-year-old. Sure. But I remember the story really well. Like, I remember it better than Christine or The Shining. Ooh, interesting. I, it was my favorite for a long time. I, I liked it more than The Shining for, mm-hmm. well, I mean, it was crazy. Um, and I think it's, I think it's like you said, there's no supernatural elements to this story. This could happen. Oh, yeah. And this maybe has something similar to it has happened before. Right. Where, you know, a crazy fan 
takes hostage of their person they're a fan of, you know, like this is completely right. plausible, not just plausible, but this could happen. And I think that's what made it so scary for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and just the, I think this is one of the first times as a child where I kind of like understood how fragile the concept of freedom is. Mm -hmm. Like someone can just take you like that can just happen. I don't care who you are, how strong or smart or whatever you are. Mm -hmm. Someone can just take you and your freedom is gone and they keep you in a box Mm -hmm. like that can happen. And, And this story really, made that a reality for me because I realized yeah. how 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 true this could actually be and how mm-hmm. this could actually happen. And so I think that's what made it especially scary for me. Um and it's just it's just a it's just so it's so compelling. It's it's such a it's such a, I can't wait to see what happens next. Yeah. I can't wait to see how he's gonna get out of this. Um and I can't wait to see how crazy they make Annie Wilkes. Right. Um, you know, and it, also, you can't. I don't think you can talk about this book without talking about the movie. Mm-hmm. I think it's one of the best adaptations. And me too. Uh, Kathy Bates is one of the best adaptations of, a, of one of his characters. Oh, absolutely. She. I think did she win an Oscar? She did, I believe. I think yeah. she won. I know she was nominated. I think she won. Mm-hmm. Um, totally earned it. She was nuts. Yeah, just absolutely batty, and she drove it home. Perfect performance. Mm-hmm. Um. And I think just the the character of Annie Wilkes, you know, this story, this story is 85% of it is two characters. Right. And in one cabin out in the middle of nowhere. And it's just, it's crazy that you can make such a compelling story. It just goes to show you how, how diverse conflict can be where you just have two people in the same setting Mm -hmm. for 90% of the book. And you can have an incredibly scary compelling great story like this totally and and it it speaks to the talents of stephen king again Mm. that he can you know get so much out of so little absolutely yeah it's just such a good book and uh and yeah on the note of the adaptation everything really great adaptation and (laughs) uh i feel like you can you can watch misery and then watch uh, Gerald's game and have a trapped in trapped in bed double feature. <laughs> yes, totally. Stephen King trapped in bed double feature. Yes. Um. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. So I'm gonna go ahead and say my number two. Okay. And then after that, do you want to do your one that's that is sure. on mine, and then I'll do my number one. The ones I have left are all out of my top five. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. That's that's fair. Um, you have three left. Three left. Okay. They're my two and then the one yeah so um i'll do my number two <laughs> and then you you'll we'll talk about your one that okay. it wasn't on my list anyway uh number two for me is a book that we reviewed uh in episode three of the podcast uh it nice so i just it's growing up with a shape-shifting clown killing your friends <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh or trying to right um but yeah it's it's got everything that I love about Stephen King and I'm so still c- kind of perturbed that it took me so long to actually read it. But, um, it's a coming of age story. It's a town with a mysterious past. It's a very huge town with a mysterious past. Um, dual narratives, dual time frames, uh, dual, um, uh, timelines, I should say. Um, and an absolutely horrifying monster. Yes. Um, just so great it is it is such a masterwork really mm-hmm. um just the way that it is just so vivid and and complete like it is another one of his tomes that's over a thousand a thousand pages but kind of similar to under the dome it you go through it it's like I mean, it kind of gets a little muddled there with the timelines and everything, so I'm excited to read it again. But mm-hmm. man, it moves. It's it's so so beautiful. And there is a passage in it that I just want to read because it's ah, oh, it's just it's just absolutely beautiful. Someone quoted it on the Stephen King subreddit, so I'm going to pull that up now and uh find it because it's like one of the best passages i think it was in stephen king's i wrote it um one of the best passages of his uh of all of his writing quote 
maybe there aren't any such things as good friends or bad friends. Maybe there are just friends, people who stand by, who, uh, who stand by you when you're hurt and who help you feel not so lonely. Maybe you're always worth being scared for and hoping for and living for. Maybe worth dying for, too, if that's what has to be. No good friends, no bad friends, only people you want, need to be with, people who build their houses in your heart. Fucking beautiful. Okay. Yeah, well. <laughs> I'm kidding now. That's incredible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's just, it's just, God, it's, it's such a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, that is kind of the book wrapped up in one nice tight sentence. It, absolutely. Or so. Yeah. Yep. Um, and yeah, we reviewed it in episode three, yes. which I re-listened to that today and we got something wrong, I think, about the uh, controversial scene with the kids at the at the end of the book. Okay. Because um, well, this is just my neuroses going, but I think we, uh, we were talking about it as if it just randomly happened. I believe, I think, if memory serves, it was actually the act that they did was I think I think in the book it's actually referred to as the ritual of chewed or something. But um but it it was to help them remember how to get out. Like the there was a way to oh. keep their bond so that they could find their way out. But anyway, okay. anyway, we'll eventually revisit, I'm sure. Okay. Um but anyway, yeah, that's my number two. It's it and where does it land on your list? It really should be in my top five. It's it's like my number six, like a it's it would be number six. Um, mm-hmm. It probably should be in my top five. Um, but yeah, I I feel the same way about it. This mm-hmm. is like there's Stephen King is incredible at bringing a cast of characters together, and mm-hmm. you know I th- I think his best is the stand. I think close second is the quartet, and a close third are the Losers Club. Yeah, like I mean oh, yeah. they're so good, and there are people who would. Diehard King fans who would switch that list around and say that the Losers Club is the best group ever, and mm-hmm. it'd be hard to argue against that. Totally, they're so likable and so just just a delightful group of kids, mm-hmm. and 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 they're fun, and like you wish that it either makes you think of the group of kids you grow up with, or makes you wish you could have been in a group this cool, right? I guess, or this enjoyable and fun and mm. lovely for lack of a better term. Um, yeah. And that's just that sentiment just drives through so much of the story. Yeah. And, and, and oh, yeah. the camaraderie and the, the, the hope in such a stark situation is, is driven home by the, the love felt between all these kids. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's an incredible skill that Stephen King has and it's on, in, it's on full display in this book. And, and there's so many other things to like about it. There's so many stories within this story that could be books or movies unto mm-hmm. themselves. And Stephen King just chose to kind of insert them into this. And it's really incredible. Um, such a great book. I, I'm, I, I read it for the first time two years ago before the movie, the remake came out. Mm. Um, cause I, I'd never read last it last year. Last year. Okay. Yeah. feels like it was longer ago than oh, that. Oh, you but, read uh, it a year and a half before that. I listened to her. Okay. Yeah. was Okay. So yeah, it's yeah. been a couple years, but I'm already getting the itch to read it again. Yep. Yeah. It's that good. Same, same here. And, uh, I just want to just bring up again in our in our movie review of it um i mentioned how annoyed i was by this like when the movie came out that uh just this is a total non sequitur it's repetitive and everything i apologize but i just want to say it again but just the the way that when the movie came out everyone was saying like oh yeah it's really good it's got that um it's got that stranger things vibe just not the case oh man it came first it yeah came first it really did stranger things has the it vibe right but anyway uh yeah <sighs> so uh, thank you for indulging me on that but yes. uh so tiny before i get to my number one what is the one remaining one that is i guess you don't technically know what my number one is i don't know what your number one is yeah. i have an idea okay of the two which do you think is not my number one uh it's cujo yes i have cujo at my it's sitting at my number 10 it's in my uh you know six to 19 mm-hmm. category there but yeah cujo uh again was one of the first five or six king books i ever read mm-hmm. um and i read it as a kid and i think it was it was a good time because one of the main characters is a kid and like you know you you spend your time with two or three main characters in a mm-hmm. very compartmentalized 
spot, kind of like mem- uh, kind of like misery. Um, and so I think being young, being a kid, I was probably 13 or something, mm-hmm. uh, kind of helped me relate to the, the main character, the, the, the child. Uh, I, I don't even remember the character name. It's been, this is another one I haven't read since I read it. Tad. First. Tad okay. Yeah. Uh, Tad and his mother. Um, I, I think that just being young helped me relate to it, mm-hmm. uh, in, in that, in that regard. And I just, I liked how, how brave this kid was. Um, and I just, I liked, I was very compelled by the idea of being kind of trapped in a car and you're, mm. it's like, you should be able to just open the door and run away, but you just, it's, it, your freedom is so close to you. It's on the other side right. of a pane of glass, but you can't get past it. That, that isolation really, really, uh, hit me hard when I was, when I read this for the first time, when I read this for the only time, um, and just the, the tragedy involved in it and uh, mm-hmm. uh, the starkness of it all. Again, I, I don't have a ton to say about it because, again, it's been mm-hmm. forever since I've read it. But uh, I just remember really being compelled by the story and then just shocked at the tragedy at the end. I was yeah. I was really uh, blown away by it. And see, I, I kind of knew what to expect because I knew the ending. But um, mm-hmm. And the reason it's not on my list is that it just I, – I didn't – I felt like it was a little – Maybe I brought in my own um, my own preconceptions into the into the reading of it because I knew that King famously doesn't remember writing it. Like he his memory doesn't not like he has no memory of actually writing it because he was all you know that was at the height of his uh, drug abuse and everything. Right. So he actually doesn't have the memory of writing the book and like reading it, it feels a little more sporadic than like his other stories are. But what I found fascinating about it was that there are bits and pieces that really kind of hint at some of his I, – I don't want to say trope, tropes because it has kind of a negative connotation to it. Uh, but some of the things that he utilizes in stories in a much cleaner and better fashion than in Cujo. But like just the idea of – like people being trapped in a place or people being dependent on other people to find them. But then the, the chances of other people finding them being hindered by complete happenstance. Mm-hmm. If that makes any sense, that was totally. really convoluted. No, but, I, I get it. Um, but yeah, just like those kinds of things. I, I love the way that it, the story kind of plays out that way, but um, I just didn't, I didn't think it was top 19 worthy, but that's cool. Yeah. I'll revisit it at some point. Love the movie. Yeah. If I, if I reread it, I might have a completely different reaction to it. Mm-hmm. So yep. nice. So we've got one more. There's just one more to talk about. Uh, it's my number one. Uh, the past is obdurate, Tiny. <laughs> um, and 112263 is my number one favorite Stephen King book. Nice. Um, of the 30 that I've read. It is a stunning love story. It is a time travel story. <laughs> um, it is a story about a teacher falling in love in the 60s while also living a double life trying to prevent uh, JFK's assassination. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's incredible. Um, it's another just mammoth book. And he does not uh, like. He spends so much time having Jake like learn everything, like meet people, and and become a part of this life in in Jody, Texas, uh, as he's waiting to save the president from assassination. And like that is so beautiful, and the way that he writes, and the in the way that Jake falls in love, not only with Sadie, but with. Um, with the town, with, with, with the town of Jody, with the time is just intoxicating to me. And it's just beautifully written. Um, and then just the fact that, uh, time is the villain. Like time is literally the antagonist in this book (laughs) in a multitude of ways. Right. Um, and I won't give away the ending or anything, but just, I just I love the way that time fights back. Like it's not hokey, it's not gimmicky or anything. It's just a very natural kind of way to, of showing that the past doesn't want to be changed. It's obdurate. It 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 doesn't want to be changed. So it's going to prevent Jake from changing it any way that he can, <laughs> any way that it can. And mm-hmm. it's just it's so beautifully demonstrated in the book and 
I love the Hulu uh, event series version of it. Um, it's just, God damn it, it's so good. And that ending just is so, so beautiful and profound. And God, it, it's just like I, I, I adore it. It's, it is <laughs> my favorite Stephen King book, 112263. Where does nice. it land on your top 19? Uh, it's in my 6 to 19. I, th- I okay. think it'd be towards the top of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I adore it too. And my, and my favorite thing about it is the fact that time is obdurate mm-hmm. and that it fights back. I think that is one of his, one of Stephen King's coolest supernat, one of his, one of my favorite ways that he has employed supernaturality i guess in in his stories um mm. and again it's one of those things where you have two concepts that are supernatural where you have time travel and sort of the kind of like the consciousness of time like you said mm-hmm. those are two things that you it's it's science fiction and it's supernatural but you kind of buy it you kind of you kind of buy into it and it's like I can see this being a thing or it's like, I don't have to, I don't really have to suspend my disbelief Mm -hmm. to get into this story. And he just, Stephen King can just sell that really well with his writing. I don't, I don't know how he does it, frankly. Um, so those two things. And then I think, I think this is one of his best love stories. Mm -hmm. I think it's up there with, uh, with, uh, Roland and Susan. Uh, Oh yeah. It's it's just really beautiful. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's again, it's tragic and stuff, and it, it's so. I just, I, it's, it's like these two people are meant to be, but they have so much to overcome right. in order to be together, and it's, it's, it's like you know, I sound like I'm talking about like a romance novel, but it's, right. it's so much deeper than that, and and it's, uh, it's, it's just so well done. I just, I really, you really root for these two people to be together. Um, yeah, and just time travel is super fun. Oh, yeah. Super oh, fun. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I really enjoyed the book. I like the series, too. Um, mm-hmm. uh, well done. I'm not a huge James Franco fan. Right. Especially when he's doing drama. But mm-hmm. uh, I think he did pretty well. I enjoyed him in this. Yeah. And the actress who played Sadie. Oh, I can't remember her name. She was great. She, oh, she was incredible. So charming. Oh, yeah. Um, And, you know, has my adoration for her and her character and her performance has very little to do with the fact that she is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's because she was really charming and just, uh, uh, very, uh, very pixie ish and Mm -hmm. perfect, perfect seeming kind of girl. Sarah Gaiden. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. She was terrific in that. So, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Great book. It's in, it's in my top 19 as well. Nice. Yeah. And that does it. There it for is for us. Yes. So uh, yeah. So that is our that those are our top nineteen uh, Stephen King novels. And yeah. So uh, as I said, when we go through and review novels in Stephen King's uh, bibliography and everything, we will um, potentially amend our top nineteens, and uh, that'll be kind of a going thing. A, a going thing when we. Uh, review Stephen King books. Um, so that'll do it for this, this episode of tower junkies next up on the podcast. We will be doing a review of a double review where we're going to return to castle rock. Uh, we're going to review episodes three and four, uh, local color and the box. And then after that, well, like I said, we have so many things, uh, to, to, to do, but I, I definitely want to crank out the castle rock reviews, but, um, in tandem with that, or after that, we're going to be doing the gunslinger, uh, pet cemetery and the movie. Um, we've, we've got a lot of balls in the air. I still have to do my Duma key review. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have notes for basically all these episodes. So cool. So yeah, so look forward to more of our, uh, podcasting coming down the pipeline. Uh, once again, if you're in Indianapolis, Shocktober in Irvington, t- October 12th, 2018 at playground production studios, tickets on sale. Now go to Shocktober and tiny. Is there anything else we need to cover? I don't think so. All right. Well, uh, as always long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. Thank you for listening to Tower Junkies, a Dark Tower podcast presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. 
You can find more of our episodes at TowerJunkiesPod.com, and you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or anywhere else podcasts are found. If you'd like to donate to the podcast, you can find ways to do that at TowerJunkiesPod.com slash donate, or become a patron for Obsessive Viewer at Patreon.com slash Obsessive Viewer for recurring donations with different reward tiers. Every donation goes toward paying the fees to keep the podcast running and is greatly appreciated. Any and all feedback on the podcast is encouraged. You can contact us by emailing us at matt at obsessiveviewer.com or by tweeting us at Tower Junkies Pod or at Obsessive Viewer and at Obsessive Tiny. You can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Tower Junkies Pod. For more podcast content from obsessiveviewer.com, Check out Anthology, my solo side project podcast where I'm reviewing The Twilight Zone as a first-time viewer and exploring other classic and contemporary science fiction anthology television shows. You can find Anthology at anthologypod.com and anywhere podcasts are found. Finally, if you're philosophically curious, check out Tiny's side project podcast, The Secular Perspective, which explores the concepts of faith, religion, and existence from the perspective of secular hosts Chad and Amanda. You can find that at thesecularperspective.com and subscribe to the podcast on the app of your choice. Once again, thank you for listening to Tower Junkies, and we'll see you next time.